Hello and welcome to our video summarizing all you need to know about the modern day history of Iraq. My name is Barbara and in this video we'll examine Iraq, its history from the early 1900s but even through the 1960s and 2000s, its key leaders, particularly Saddam Hussein, its wars that it underwent but also present day Iraq. So let's get started. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that Iraq gained formal independence as a country in 1932. However, it remained subject to British imperial influence up until after the Second World War, which began in 1939 and ended in 1945. In 1945, Iraq then joined the UN and it became a founding member of the Arab League, and in 1948, it entered the Arab-Israeli War along with other members of the Arab League in order to defend Palestinian rights against Israelis. This war had a negative impact on its economy and the government had to allocate 40% of available funds to the army. Now, when it comes to the Iraqi rev revolution, there was a lot of political instability and this happened on even a greater scale following the overthrow of the monarchy in Iraq in 1958. However, the installation of an Arab nationalist and socialist regime, the Ba'ath Party in a bloodless clue, led by Abd al-Karim Qasim, brought about relative stability at this time. By this point, Iraq had left the pro-British Baghdad Pact. Drawn from the country's rich oil reserves, the regime was able to finance ambitious projects and development plans throughout the 1970s and this regime built one of the largest and best equipped armed forces in the Arab world at the time. Now when it comes to the 1960s, in 1961, Kuwait, another Arab country, gained independence from Britain. However, Iraq claimed sovereignty over this country. Qasim based Iraq's claim on the assertion that Kuwait had been a district of the Ottoman province of Basra, unjustly severed by the British from the main body of the Iraqi state when it was created in the 1920s. Britain reacted really strongly to Iraq's claim and sent troops to Kuwait to deter Iraq. Qasim was forced to back down and in October 1963, Iraq recognized the sovereignty of Kuwait. Furthermore, in February 1963, Qasim had been assassinated. Now Saddam Hussein became and emerged as a very important political figure in Iraq. So in the period between 1963 and 1973, Iraq experienced two coups until Saddam Hussein took over leadership in 1979. So in 1979, the Ba'ath Party was now a countrywide organisation reaching down even to the smallest and most remote villages in Iraq and in an unprecedented way, it had a huge influence on even modest neighbourhoods as well as very wealthy neighbourhoods. In addition, the Popular Army and the Youth Organisation brought ever larger numbers into the paramilitary formations which were established by the regime. Saddam Hussein decided that no dissent would be allowed in party ranks, no opposition outside the party could be tolerated, and ideological commitment were only to party ideals alone, and they were insufficient to guarantee the loyalty of internal security officers. He also jailed, executed and assassinated the regime's opponents, effectively installing an autocratic dictatorship. Saddam Hussein then established a National Assembly in 1980, setting up the first parliament since the overthrow of the monarchy in 1958. This was meant to create the impression of national unity and to give Saddam Hussein another forum for presenting himself as a national leader. His new regime modernised the countryside and rural areas of Iraq, mechanising agriculture and establishing farm cooperatives. Saddam Hussein's organisational prowess was credited with Iraq's rapid pace of development in the 1970s. Development went forward at such a fevered pitch that two million people from other Arab countries and even Yugoslavia in Eastern Europe worked in Iraq to meet the growing demand for labour. However, Hussein's ambitions soon led him to be involved in various conflicts with disastrous results to the infrastructure of Iraq. So of course there have been lots of questions on whether Saddam Hussein was an autocratic leader. He was widely regarded, and still is by some people, as a very ruthless autocrat who led the country into some catastrophic military campaigns. 
The first was the Iran-Iraq War in 1980 to 1988, and the second was the Persian Gulf War in 1990 to 91. And these conflicts left Iraq isolated from the international community and financially and socially drained. Now let's begin with causes of the Iran and Iraq War, which lasted for eight years. So the first cause that led to this war were poor interstate relationships. Now, Iraq's relations with Iran had grown increasingly strained after the Shah was overthrown in 1979. If you, of course, want to know a little bit more about the Iranian Revolution, do check out our other video on our channel, which details this in far more detail. However, now, once this revolution had occurred, Iran was not recognised, uh, or rather, Iraq recognised Iran's new Shiite Islamic government. However, the Iranian leaders wanted nothing to do with the Ba'ath regime, which they denounced as secular. Ayatollah Khomeini, who is a leader of the Iranian revolution, proclaimed his policy of exporting the revolution. And Iraq was high on the list of countries whose governments were to be overthrown and replaced by a replica of an Islamic regime, which was currently in Iran. In addition, Iran still occupied three small pieces of territory along, along the border it shared with Iraq that was supposed to be returned to Iraq under the Treaty of 1975. Another reason for this war were fears of spillover revolutionary concerns. Now, of course, when Khomeini came to power in Iran in February 1979, his example inspired many Shiites in Iraq to engage in greater political activism. Mass pro-Khomeini demonstrations and guerrilla activity became regular occurrences. The man who encouraged these activities and in whom many saw an Iraq Khomeini was the young Ayatollah Mohammed Bakir al sadr The Ba'ath regime in Iraq feared that as long as Khomeini was in power, his Islamic revolution could serve as a source of inspiration for Shiite revolutionaries living within Iraq. Thus, the Ba'ath regime cracked down on the Shiite movement with great ferocity, and hundreds of people were executed and imprisoned. And in April 1980, Saddam ordered the execution of al sadr and his sister. Furthermore, another reason that contributed to this war was Iran's isolation. So at the same time, Khomeini in Iran had isolated his country from the international community and Iran's armed forces were drained. While Iraq, on the other hand, however, was very well organised, it had a very well equipped military, a fast growing economy, and it had relatively better foreign relations with other countries. Collectively, all these factors convinced Saddam Hussein that he could win a war with the less organised forces of Iran, and in so doing, the Iraqi leaders' likely goals were to remove Ayatollah Khomeini from power, replace his regime with one that was more friendly to Iraq, and also demarcate its border with Iran. The war, of course, broke out, and Iraq bombed Iranian air bases and other strategic targets. In the week following the invasion, the UN Security Council called for a ceasefire and appealed to Iran and Iraq to settle the dispute peacefully. Failure to reach an agreement led the war to extend to the Gulf area. In July 1987, the UN Security Council unanimously passed Resolution 598, urging Iran and Iraq to accept a ceasefire, withdraw the forces to internationally recognised boundaries, and settle the frontier disputes by negotiations held under UN auspices. Iraq agreed to abide by the terms if Iran reciprocated. However, Iran demanded amendments condemning Iran as an aggressor, which would make Iraq liable to pay for war reparations and call on all foreign natives to leave the Gulf. This, of course, led to it being a war with no victor. This became a very costly eight-year war, which was inconclusive. And although Iraq declared victory in 1988, it actually achieved a weary return to the status quo. Nothing had changed, and Ayatollah Khomeini still remained in power. This war left Iraq with the largest military establishment in the Persian Gulf region, but also it had huge debts and an ongoing rebellion by Kurdish elements in its northern mountains, and the government obviously suppressed these rebellion in a very bloody way. Eight years of war had taken also a very terrible toll on the Iraqi population. The war had cost them an estimated quarter of lives in terms of the victims, and over 60,000 Iraqis remained prisoners of the Iranians and nearly 1 million Iraqis were compelled to serve in the armed forces. 
there were also war crimes perpetrated during this war. So mass chemical, a mass chemical weapons attack on the city of Halabia in March 1988 during this war was is usually attributed to Saddam's regime, although responsibility for this attack is a matter of some dispute. The event has become iconic in depictions of Saddam Hussein's cruelty, and of course, much, much later when he was ousted by Bush and Tony Blair, the mass weapons of chemical destruction and mass weapons of destruction was again used. And so, of course, this became a really important and iconic time. Also, there were estimates of casualties at the time, so the Iran-Iraq war, which ranged from several hundred people to at least 7,000 people. The Iraqi government continued to be supported by important members of the international community, including China and the USSR. Now, it had massive consequences in terms of the aftermath of this war. So Iraq began a program of reconstruction concentrating on the areas that had suffered most throughout the war, but the country had already little cash. Iraq was deeply in debt and however it continued to spend large sums on armaments and this caused inflation and vast unemployment within the country. Furthermore, the government promised to open the political process by allowing multi-party elections and greater press freedoms. To enhance Iraq's position in the Arab world, Saddam Hussein began to negotiate a set of bilateral agreements with its neighbours. So, in early 1989, he concluded non-aggression pacts with Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. He also established an Arab Cooperation Council with Jordan, Egypt and Yemen to promote economic and cultural development. Now, another important war is the 1990 Kuwait invasion, which is also known as the Gulf War. So a long-standing territorial dispute led to the invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Iraq accused Kuwait of violating the Iraqi border to secure oil resources and demanded that its debt tariff payments should be waived. Direct negotiations began in 1990, but they soon failed. On 2nd August 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Now, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait was really a textbook example of international behaviour that endangers international peace and security. It was a blatant violation of one of the UN Charter's most fundamental rules, the prohibition of the use of force in international relations. At the time of the invasion, Kuwait's army numbered just 16,000 men, while Iraq had about 950,000 men, close to a million. It also had 4,500 tanks and hundreds of fighter jets and helicopters. Within hours, most resistance had faded and the Kuwaiti royal family were forced to flee and two days later, Iraq was in complete control of Kuwait. However, Kuwait did have very powerful allies and this was of course shown in Operation Desert Storm. So the United Nations was quick to mark the invasion a violation of international law. On the very day of the invasion, the Security Council adopted Resolution 660, determining that there exists a breach of peace and security as regards the Iraq invasion of Kuwait. On 6 August, the UN Security Council sought collective international action against Iraq by calling upon all states to impose trade restrictions against Iraqi entities. As months passed, the Security Council resorted to the ultimate coercive measure, which was essentially the use of military force. It authorised the countries cooperating with the government of Kuwait to use all necessary means to uphold and implement Resolution 660, and use all subsequent relevant resolutions to restore international peace and security in the area. And thus, Operation Desert Storm was launched with more than 540,000 military personnel from 31 countries participating in a coalition led by the United States. Only 10 days after the start of the military air campaign, the coalition had absolutely achieved absolute supremacy by defeating the Iraqi army and systematically destroying Iraqi infrastructure. On February 27, 1991, six weeks after the start of the military intervention and after only 100 hours of ground offensive, the permanent representative of Iraq at the UN addressed two letters to the President of the Security Council to announce the withdrawal of Iraqi troops from Kuwait and Iraq's acceptance of all relevant resolutions. There was then, of course, a ceasefire, which was announced by the US on 28th February 1991. And the UN Secretary General at the time, Javier Perez de Cuella, met with Saddam Hussein to discuss the Security Council timetable for the withdrawal of troops from Kuwait. Iraq agreed to the UN terms for a permanent ceasefire in April 1991, and strict conditions were imposed, demanding the disclosure and destruction of all stockpiles of weapons. At the end of the Gulf War, 
In Resolution 686, the UN Security Council demanded that Iraq accept in principle its liability under international law for any loss, damage or injury arising in regard to Kuwait and third states as a result of the invasion and illegal occupation of Kuwait. Now when it comes to the aftermath of this particular war, after the invasion, the UN Security Council imposed economic sanctions on Iraq, providing for a full trade embargo. From 1991 until 2003, the effects of government policy and sanctions regime led to hyperinflation in Iraq, widespread poverty, and also, in some extreme cases, malnutrition. The historically generous state welfare provision that had been central to the regime's governing strategy disappeared virtually overnight, and the large and well-educated Iraqi middle class that had grown in the years of plenty to form the bedrock of Iraq's society became impoverished. The story of Iraq from 91 to 2003 is of a country which suffered a profound macroeconomic shock. Another key event that really impacted and shifted the trajectory of Saddam Hussein's power, but also which marked the end of his power, was of course 9-11, which essentially is the September 11 attacks, and the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. So of course, as you hopefully should know, on September 11, 2001, America was attacked by planes which were manned by Al-Qaeda operatives. And of course, if you want to know a little bit about that, do check out our other videos, which summarize a history of Afghanistan, but also our USSR video, which details USSR's and Afghanistan's war, and also the consequent aftermath under Taliban regime. However, for the purposes of this video, on 29 January 2002, US President George W. Bush delivered his very famous Axis of Evil speech at the State of the Union Address. This speech really echoed the US's anger at terrorist elements within the Middle East, and of course its anger as a result of the attacks that happened in the US on September 11 in 2001. His speech stated that states like Iran, Iraq and North Korea and the terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. By seeking weapons of mass destruction, these regimes pose a grave and growing danger. I will not wait on events while dangers gather. Now, of course, this led to the US, along with its allies, to invade Iraq and ultimately to the outsting and the ultimate death of Saddam Hussein himself. Now, there were original justifications for this invasion. Originally, Iraq was accused of harbouring weapons of mass destruction and having allegedly links to Al-Qaeda, both of which could not be permitted in a post-9-11 world, with Al-Qaeda being directly responsible for the September 11 attacks on America. Now, how did this war unfold? Now, in October, there was a congressional resolution in the US authorizing the US President George W. Bush to use armed forces of the US to defend against the threat posed by Iraq. This resolution was passed, and at the UN, the United States negotiated with France and others for eight weeks, and on November 8th, they passed a UN Security Council Resolution 1441 by a vote of 15 to zero. The resolution backed by American intelligence declared Iraq to be in material breach of ceasefire terms and they gave Saddam Hussein a final opportunity to comply with disarmament obligations. However, the resolution did not authorise all necessary means, that's to say, force to be used. Iraq agreed to the resolution and they opened the doors to inspections teams led by Hans Blix and Mohammed El Baradei who declared Iraq to be devoid of weapons of mass destruction, and they released 43 volumes of documentation to prove it. However, when evidence for either Iraq's weapons of mass destruction or links to terrorism failed to emerge in the wake of the war and the nine subsequent years of military occupation, the Bush administration was forced to reframe the war and redefine the parameters of success. To do this, the US began speaking about spreading democracy to Iraq as if this had been one of the goals originally of the war itself, but as we've mentioned, they were not. Now, when it comes to the US invasion of Iraq, in March 2003, they launched a preemptive strike on a sovereign nation without any UN approval or popular domestic or global support. And of course, this war was very unpopular both in the US, but also internationally. 
At least 134,000 Iraqi people died as a direct result of this American invasion. Now to go into some more details of factors that led to the Iraq invasion of 2003, so the US's invasion of Iraq. So of course the first and the predominant one was the post 9-11 mindset and the general fear of terrorism and the paranoia that really dominated a lot of US politicians' minds. So now, the strategic environment immediately after the 9-11 terrorist attacks was characterised by an acute sense of imminent national danger and urgency. In addition, President Bush felt a heavy burden for protecting the nation. A rogue regime, which he saw as having weapons of mass destruction and ties to terrorists, aroused the fears of a much more devastating attack on US homeland. Another reason was of course the war on terror, which was pledged after the September 11 bombings. So during his 2002 general speech, general assembly speech rather at the UN, President Bush tied the concept of preemptive strike specifically to Iraq, noting that with every step the Iraq regime takes towards gaining and deploying the most terrible weapons, our own options to confront that regime will narrow. This concept was formalized in the September 2002 National Security Strategy of the United States of America, which said, we cannot let our enemy strike first. The overlap between states that sponsor terror and those that pursue weapons of mass destruction compel us to action. Of course, another reason was Saddam Hussein's own negative track record. So Saddam Hussein had shown himself to be a very ruthless villain. He'd used chemical weapons against his own people and against Iranian troops in the 1980s. He'd also invaded Kuwait and started a bloody war against Iran. He perpetually threatened Israel. He refused to implement at least 10 UN Security Council resolutions aimed at ending Iraq's weapons of mass destruction programs and he'd expelled weapons inspectors in 1998. Also, it's important to consider US's military superiority. So there was growing recognition that the US's military power was in a class of its own. The US had developed new military technologies and tactics that Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld championed as defense transformation. These included data networking, accurate and voluminous intelligence, instantaneous command and control, and precision strike. Developed in the 1980s and 1990s, they'd been on display during Desert Storm and more recently in Afghanistan, where this military transformation technology toppled the Taliban regime effortlessly and created a sense of total American military dominance. By contrast, the Iraqi military had suffered contractions of 35% in its army and 60% in its air force before Desert Storm, so Iraq stood no chance in this war. Another aspect that influenced this war was the idea of stability in Middle East. So the rationale went that if the US could change the regime in Baghdad, which is the capital city of Iraq, it might create a new model of democracy in the Middle East. After all, democracy was on the rise globally in what the political scientist Samuel Huntington called the third wave. Just as it was flourishing throughout Eastern Europe and Latin America, it could take hold in Iraq and serve as a model for the Arab world. Democracy in the Middle East would be a geostrategic game changer, it would foster stability in the strife region, re region and provide America's ally Israel with a far more secure environment. Moreover, a new regime in Iraq would allow the US to remove its troops from Saudi Arabia, where they fueled extremism and to have another friendly source of oil. However, there were major errors in this campaign, making this war extremely unpopular. So firstly, it was the notion of the misinterpretation and the misuse of intelligence. So the case for Saddam's complicity in September 11, or at least for his strong ties with terror organisations, was extremely weak. The case for his possessions of weapons of mass destruction speared stronger and drove decision making. After all, he'd used chemical weapons against Iranians and Kurds in the 1980s. But this intelligence was wrong. Iraq had gotten rid of its weapons of mass destruction. Some say this was the worst US intelligence failure since the founding of the modern intelligence community. In addition, many people say that data was really cherry-picked. So the Policy Counterterrorism Evaluation Group in the Pentagon began producing what they said were alarming interpretations of the murky intelligence about Saddam Hussein, weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. 
Thus, they were in essence cherry picking the intelligence in order to draw links between Al Qaeda and Iraq and thus justify intervention. There was also a dictatorial dem diplomacy that damaged this Atlantic alliance, and there was a failure to prepare for a post conflict occupation and stabilization program in Iraq, which essentially resulted in anarchy and civil war in the country once Saddam Hussein was toppled and ultimately killed. Another important error was the failure of, uh, to allow inspections to be completed. So prior to the attack, there was no evidence of the pre presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. However, the leader of the UN Monitoring, Verification and Inspection Commission, Hans Blix, felt that the inspectors still needed months to verify the accuracy of Hussein's statements concerning Iraq's weapons arsenals. Inspections were seen as moving too slowly for the George Bush team. The American military, which had already begun to deploy forces to the region, was in a position to invade, and there was a narrowing window to attack before the weather became blisteringly hot. Now, of course, the aftermath of this war has been significant. So firstly, large segments of the Sunni minority in Iraq have resorted to armed resistance, and they then resorted to a full-blown insurgency. As this insurgency grew, it opened the door to both foreign and Iraqi religiously motivated terrorists called Al-Qaeda in Iraq, who attacked the new state and the Shia population, especially soft targets such as mosques and pilgrimages, and this then precipitated a Shia backlash in the form of death squads, some from within the interior ministry who targeted not just the Sunni terrorists and insurgents, but Sunnis in general. Meanwhile, Shia militias backed by Iran attacked American occupiers. Of course, in Iraq, there's been an increased US presence, so the US military was unprepared to deal with the Sunni uprising, the Shia violence, and the Sunni Shia warfare. Eventually, they decided to increase their troop presence and remunerate Sunni sheikhs to root out insurgents and terrorists. However, inadequate funds were earmarked to train and employ hundreds of thousands of former Iraqi soldiers, security forces, militia, and resistance fighters who would have to be disarmed, demobilized, and reintegrated. Of course, another consequence was this led to an administrative crisis. So on top of all of these difficulties, there was a shortage of competent Iraqis for government, industry, and security forces because of the way the eradication of the Ba'ath Party unfolded. So that's all. If you found this video useful, do subscribe to our channel and give our video a thumbs up, but also visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There, you'll find useful revision guides, model answers written at an A grade level, and exam papers that you can use to practice, both if you're studying this particular topic for your exams, but also more broadly, any history topics or English topics. Thank you so much for listening.